Do you remember the name of the sermon series? The Seven Deadly Sins. Lucky you, you get to hear about sin for seven weeks. Something we all have in common is that we do sin, yes? Started a few weeks ago, I started by talking about envy, then I talked about lust, and today I'm going to talk about a different kind of sin. It's one of the seven, and remember we said that the sin, these sins are deadly because they lead to other sins. It's like they're they're primary sins. And the other sins, for the most part, have to do with things that you do that you shouldn't do, committing an act that you shouldn't commit. But there are sins of omission. It's when we fail to do what we're supposed to do, according to God's will, and in that sense, sin against God and displease God. There's an opportunity maybe to bless, there's an opportunity to make a change, there's an opportunity to help, and we choose not to. And maybe in our own lives, there's something that needs to be altered or adjusted, and we just choose not to, or we fail to muster the courage to change. And that sin is called sloth. And some of you, when you hear that word, might have different reactions. Some of you might say, you mean like the little animal in the zoo? Or you might say, what is it? Or you might say, isn't that laziness? And you're thinking, if it's laziness, I may be in trouble, if that's a sin. Well, I guess it has to do with a dimension of laziness, not doing something you should do. But from a Bible standpoint, biblical teaching, it's more than just laziness. It's often knowing the right thing to do, but not doing it because we're afraid or because of some other reason. And the teaching that Jesus offers us in regards to this sin is is abundantly clear in a parable that he told in Matthew chapter 25. Now, many of you know that Jesus was great at telling stories, but he didn't tell stories just to be a storyteller. He told stories that had a meaning or a purpose or a specific message. And at this point in his ministry, in Matthew 25, he's trying to communicate with his followers what the kingdom of heaven is like. The people of his day and the people of our day, we kind of know what this life is like. But we don't always know what the kingdom of God is like because the kingdom of God or the reign of God is different than what goes on a lot of times in this life. This life is often about money, power, that sort of thing, but the kingdom of God is is about other things, and and Jesus was always trying to teach the people what the kingdom was about, and so he told parables, and in this one particular parable, chapter 25, beginning at verse 14, he's talking about a master who has three servants, and he goes away, this master does, and entrusts to his three servants amounts of money, different amounts of money. And it's called talents. And a talent was a little over $1,000. So to the one servant, he gives five talents. To the second servant, he gives two talents. And to the third servant, he gives one talent. So they're like trustees. You know what a trustee is? A trustee is someone who cares for something that they don't own. It's like um, your neighbor goes away and says, will you take care of our cat for us while we're gone? So while they're gone, you're going over there and you're feeding the cat and letting the cat out if it has to go out, whatever. You're a trustee for that cat. You don't own the cat, but it's been put in your stead. You are responsible during that time that the owner is away. We have church trustees. And church trustees are people who take care of the building and the grounds of the church. It's God's church. It's God's house. But they take care of it. So we have three trustees. I want to read the parable for you in case you've never heard it. And what's interesting is what the three servants do with what they were given. And how two out of the three do real well. But the one servant who's guilty of sloth does not do very well beginning at verse 14. Kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and 
entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put the money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Well, the man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So two out of the three servants got it right, but the third one did not. He gave the money, and the first two went and invested it. And, uh, it's interesting how it says that the uh, first servant immediately went and put the money to work. He didn't even waste any time. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do with the resources he had been given to honor his master. So the first two did well with what they were given. So when the master came back, they had more to show for it. The third servant was afraid. And that's what he says when the master comes back. That's his excuse. He said, I was afraid. So I just put it in the ground where it wasn't going to do anything, wasn't going to earn any interest, wasn't going to help anybody. But see, at least I can give you back what you gave me. What is Jesus saying in the parable? Well, there are probably a number of lessons or points that can be drawn out of this, but the one thing that's clear is the third servant was punished for his lack of courage to do something with what he was given. He was afraid. And the master even points out, you knew that I was demanding and wanted you to do something with what I gave you. You knew it, and even though you knew it, you still didn't do anything with what I gave you. So he knowingly hid it without multiplying it. Sloth is the sin of knowing what we should do and not doing it. It's choosing another way, which leads to other sins. The people in Flint, Michigan, as most of you know, are in an uproar now because of their water, because the people who were in government decided to save money, I guess, and took the easy way and didn't do what they should have done because they failed to do the right thing. A lot of people are being poisoned. Many years ago, when the Nazi regime was just starting to kick up, Jews who were living in Germany began to get a sense that uh, they were in trouble. One particular Jew by the name of Bruno Bettelheim later became a psychoanalyst and wrote a number of books. In one of his books, he tells the story of how when he was a young man, he and other friends and family members who were younger could sense clearly what was happening in Germany and how they needed to get out. 
And they talked to their elders, to the older people in the family, and said, look, we need to leave. Bad things are happening here. The Germans clearly are going to be coming after us. But the older adults said, but this is where we've lived. This is where our stuff is. This is where our homes are. That's a lot of trouble, you know, to get up and move and leave. And so even after weeks of pleading with the older adults in his family, they refused. And so Bruno and his young family members and friends left, and he never saw the rest of his family again because they were all killed during the Holocaust. There's a story out of New York where a young couple was arguing on a street corner. And the young man got mad at his girlfriend, and he started to beat on her, and people could hear the screams in the neighborhood all around, and they were lifting up their windows and looking out to see what was going on. For 30 minutes, he beat on her, stabbing her 26 times. No one called 911. No one came down to help. And she bled to death on the corner. How many times is it within our power to help, but we just say, well, I don't want to get involved. You know, that could get messy, or that's complicated, or that's going to cost me a lot. The sin of sloth hits us in so many ways, folks. The person who doesn't eat well has a big dinner every night and then sits in front of the TV for five hours with a bag of chips. I'm bowling down your alley now, right? <laughs> you know, it's, you know better? Or you, will you do anything about it? It's hard. And I don't want to hit on smokers because I've never been a smoker, but I understand that nicotine is a hard thing to kick. But we know now what happens if you smoke for a long time. It, it can damage your health. Sometimes escaping the sin of sloth means getting help for something that you know you can't do yourself. But it's, it's having the courage and the faith to say, I need help. This pattern of destruction that I'm on in my life is going to do me in. But I can't seem to get off that treadmill. I need, I need help. The man or woman who works in the same job for 40 years <laughs> hates their job tells everybody how they hate their job, gets an ulcer because they hate their job, and ends up becoming an old, bitter person. Can we feel sorry for them? That's the path they've chosen. If they've never looked for other work, never bothered to pursue another career, yes, sometimes other jobs are hard to find, but has the person tried? There are so many ways in which we fail to become all that God would want us to be. Young people getting inappropriate pictures on their phone from friends at school. Know that it's wrong, but they'll, they'll participate. They'll send inappropriate pictures or messages back because they don't want to seem that they're not cool and they're not part of what's going on. They know better, but they don't change. They don't stop. And as a result, they can get in big trouble on many levels. Sometimes we need to conclude in our prayers the prayer of forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for the sin of sloth because there may have been something that I should have done and I didn't do it because I didn't feel like it or I didn't want to pay the price. I just wasn't willing. It takes courage sometimes to do the right thing. And I believe that sometimes we need to pray for courage. We need to pray for faith. We need to pray for grace and strength. But I'll tell you, this is uh, Black History Month, as I'm sure you know. And so I've been reading about some of the amazing African-American heroes of our country. And uh, Harriet Tubman is one of my favorite because of uh, the courage that she had. Do you know about Harriet Tubman? You think of her, you probably think of the Underground Railroad. She was born around 1820. We don't know exactly because they didn't keep good records back then. Um, born in a plantation in Maryland. From the time she was young, she was an adolescent when uh, a, a slave owner asked her to help apprehend a runaway slave. She refused to help. 
And so he threw a two-pound weight at her, hit her in the head, and the rest of her life she suffered headaches and dizziness. And in 1849, she decided, along with her two brothers, to escape. And so she escaped from Maryland and she made it up to Philadelphia. But even so, she realized that her family was still back in Maryland on the plantation, and so she went back time after time to help her family uh, escape. And then the next year, in 1850, they passed the Fugitive Slave Law, which meant that if a slave escaped and went to the North, which normally meant they would be free, that the North now had to return that slave to their master in the South. So she redirected the Underground Railroad to Canada so that slaves could be completely free and get out of the country. You know, she was involved in the Civil War, representing the North, the Union. She was a cook, she was a nurse, she was a spy for the North. And she was involved in a raid on South Carolina that ended up freeing 700 slaves. You think she didn't take risks? <laughs> you think it wasn't scary for her? But you know what? She saw that it was wrong. And I'm guessing that she couldn't put her head on a pillow at night without trying to do something about it, even if it would cost her her life. And when she was in her later years and she was an old lady, she never had much in life. Other people used to donate to her when they realized what a courageous woman she was. But she did have this little plot of land, and she donated it so that it could be used to build uh, what they used to call an old folks' home, a retirement home. And she ended up living there when she died. Amazing courage. I think about Heather Mingle going to India to do what she's going to do because she has a passion for that, because God's saying to her, what's happening is wrong, and will we do something about it? And she's saying, yes, I want to do something about it. And I'm glad that her home church, the Sickerville United Methodist Church, can support her. Because that's what we should be doing. Amen? When we can make a difference, we should be making a difference. Think of the parable of the talents. What has God entrusted to you? What has he given you? Besides your family and, and your financial resources, your home, your car. Has he given you a passion to help other people? Is there something you've been wanting to do, but you're afraid? Have you been wanting to increase your offering to the church, but you're like, well, if I do that, I'm not going to be able to get Starbucks three times a week, and I'm not going to be able to go to the movies every Friday night, and you know, it'd be this huge sacrifice. But is God calling you to sacrifice? Knowing that what you give is going to make a difference for other people? Because we have a camp here, a basketball camp in the spring for kids in the neighborhood, and every day of basketball, there's a gospel message given at halftime that what you give supports the ministries of this church and mission teams that we send out, uh, young people, young adults, that go and share the gospel message? Is God asking you to give more? Do you know of a ministry going on in the church that you say, well, yeah, I could probably do that, but I don't want to give up my Monday nights or whatever it is? I worry about the sin of sloth. You know why? Because when I get done... When the journey ends for me and I come before the Lord, and we all will, no matter whether the elevator's going up or down, we'll all come before the Lord. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share my joy with me. I don't want to hear about weeping and gnashing of teeth, which was the biblical way of saying that that third servant was to be separated to a place of darkness, separated from God. I don't want to be separated from God's love. Sloth is a sneaky sin because it's not something that we've done. It's something that we've failed to do. May God help us to do the right things, to live the right way, to honor God in everything that we say and do. And when we can do good, when we can honor Christ in our lives, to do it. May God give us the courage to step up and step out and make him proud. Lord, thank you for the teachings of the Bible. Thank you for the parables that Jesus has given us. There's no doubt that he told stories because some of the messages Jesus brought were hard to hear. And so by bringing those messages in story form, the message kind of sneaks up on us 
and hits the bullseye in our heart. Help us to hear today, O oh Lord, what you're wanting to say to us. Make us mindful that we're called not only to avoid certain behaviors, but to be engaging in certain behaviors. Lord, we want to be like Jesus, but it's hard, and we don't always get it right, so forgive us and lift us up. Help us to see the models, the role models all around us, people in history, people of all colors who've done great things in the name of God, in the name of humanity, and help us to follow those examples, but most of all, the example of Jesus, for we ask in his name. Amen.